Okay, guys. Good morning. I hope you had a fun opening plenary, and we're excited to have you here. I love watching everyone take their Instagram photos at the podium. Make sure to tag everybody. Um, and you know, we need some new blood as speakers here in the room. So. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm Natalie Byrne. I'm going to be moderating today's session. Um, and we want to start first by recognizing a commitment because that is what the Clinton Global Initiative is all about, making commitments so that we all move forward together to make the world a better place. So this commitment announcement is under poverty alleviation, building financial inclusion at the bottom of the pyramid. So. The commitment name is My Path, and it was put together by Jennifer Megason. What the challenge is, in poor communities, gaps between social service providers and people who need those services often occur. And once people's income has riven, risen to exceed the max level for social service programs, they often find themselves at a loss when seeking to obtain care and improve their living conditions. This means ongoing and emergency services are out of reach for people who need them most. My path is addressing to work and close this gap. It's an app that works on your smartphone, which makes it very accessible. My path allows users to identify their needs, access safety net programs and educational opportunities, and track their progress towards greater life stability. This includes emergency interventions, both short and long term, such as education, health, and housing goals. Progress on the app is tracked by user reports of satisfaction and metrics of how many programs are secure. The best part is the initial target audience are people who are left out of the system with low income, single parents, and even recent high school graduates that are suffering from poverty. So let's please give a hand for Jennifer Megason, who I'd like to invite to the stage. trying to do, so we encourage you to keep your wheels turning on commitments that you may make in the future. And now we're going to have an amazing panel discussion. I'm so excited to invite my esteemed panelists up. Sasha and Savitra, will you please join me on stage? travel to get here for this weekend. Yes, and we've had some crazy weather. All of you who are live streaming in, we have around 100 countries, 90 represented here, and we know we, you shared all of that with your friends and family at home, so they're tuning in, um, and we're just excited that the lights are on, to be honest. <laughs> so thank you for joining. As, as mentioned, I'm Natalie Byrne. I'm going to be your moderator, but it's going to be a very open, fluid discussion. Um, I'm a longtime friend of CGI, and I am a former commitment maker um, as well. I'm actually two, so feel free to ask me about the process. Um, I think it's important for us to frame today's conversation. We're going to dive really deep into the individual ways we're tackling this in our organizations, in our lives, but we're going to start first in the CGI way with really setting the macro up. So today we're going to think about low-income regions that are experiencing increased poverty and extreme vulnerability as a result of the pandemic. The combined impact on economic growth and inequality has led to an increase in global poverty of more than 100 million people in 2020 alone. So we can add what that might look like now that we are in 2023. The IMF's World Economic Outlook report indicated that the global economy is projected to recover in the next two years. That sounds good, right? An anticipated GDP growth of 4.4%. Yet, 
This projected growth will not be reaching everyone equally. Reductions of GDP coupled with high levels of unemployment, income inequality, and really, the pandemic is still hitting different parts of the world in different ways than here in the US where you're seeing um, more of like a lighter approach to precautions. There's parts of the world that are really, really suffering from the pandemic right now, it's important to know. So in the recovery globally is being impacted and especially in developing countries. So what does this mean to us? How does this affect where we are today and the ripple effect that we can actually feel here at home? So we're gonna dive in. Um, I'd like everyone to keep in mind uh, the idea that entrepreneurs, nonprofits, governments, financial institutions, we can all work together on this. That's the only way we're gonna be able to move forward. And I feel very strongly that there's no going back and rebuilding what we had before. We need new ideas, new partnerships, new companies. So we're gonna jump, jump, jump into all of this today. Um, and I wanna start you know, I just kind of set kind of a grim uh, stage, but also one that has a lot of opportunity. Um, I think as we think about what's happening in the macro, I'd love if first you introduce yourself um, and, and kind of how you've seen this um, on the national and global scale. Hi everyone, my name is Demetra Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of Brasilia, and we're a SaaS technology platform. Uh, we essentially help nonprofit organizations and vendors uh, increase their day-to-day -day capacity. Uh, we help large funders like Goldman Sachs and Kellogg Foundation and Ford Foundation uh, scale their impact, so where they're deploying capital into the initiatives and projects that they fund. Um, when we think about this on a large scale, when I think about Brazilian, how we responded to it, I had a little bit of, uh, I would say, foresight, and that's because I'm from New Orleans, and so I actually experienced when I was in college and at uh, LSU, uh, Hurricane Katrina. And when Hurricane Katrina happened, you saw all of these major institutions, you saw FEMA and all this recovery go into effect, right? And so people were scrambling and trying to figure out how do we solve for such a huge disaster. Now, quite different, versus a natural disaster and uh, a global health pandemic, right? Uh, but we knew that the first thing we needed to do was mobilize the organizations that we were working with and how could we reach them as quickly as possible and even faster as a tech company. I love hearing that. In part because uh, the work that we've gotten involved in yeah, is really around how do you scale the grassroots? How do you scale those beautiful community-led initiatives that are the most impactful, the most powerful work that's happening in our world? And sometimes people think, oh, well, if it's small scale, it can't be big scale. But it's actually the things that grow to be the largest are the things that are hyper-decentralized, where there is local power that then is networked up to become very large scale. Like microfinance is one of the uh, dominant models of this, right? Let women have loans, start small businesses, is one of the things that scaled in development efforts in the last few decades. But to come back a little bit, first of all, fantastic to meet a lot of the folks in this room, and thank you for being here and being interested in how do we build a more equitable world. If anything, this is the dominant conversation we should be having uh, all over the place. Um, some of those numbers were grim that you were mentioning before around uh, global poverty uh, reversing course. We had actually been making great progress against poverty. And then during the pandemic, 90 million plus people fell back into extreme poverty. Gender equity reversed. We lost 32 years of gender equity work uh, during the pandemic. Climate change is another issue that is also disproportionately affecting those same communities. So communities facing poverty continue to be hit again and again and again by these global uh, factors, the pandemic, inflation, the gender equity, uh, climate change, and they're often bearing the brunt of things that they are not responsible for creating, right? And so the solutions have to come in both forms. Um, I'm Sasha Fisher, I run an organization called Spark Microgrants, and uh, we started Spark to see how can we decentralize the efforts that are out there to support communities facing rural poverty. The dominant model is one that's top down and prescriptive. We impose solutions on communities facing poverty. That's very silly. Communities already know what they need. They know how to get it. They have all the right answers. So why don't we get money directly into their hands and the power, the decision-making power in their hands to make the decisions over how to use that capital. 
we do program in some inclusion parts of this, making sure women and men, young and old, can participate in making those decisions together and not replicate this sort of colonial, capitalist, nation-state model of uh, elite capture, but disrupt the elite capture model where a few people have power and a lot of people don't, to a day where lots of people, we all have power. We all have economic, social, and political power, and it's shared. This is, that's a great point, and I think it brings up something that I'd like to explore around words that we use a lot. You'll hear sustainable and equitable. Let's build a more sustainable and equitable world, right? If we're all thinking about new ways and innovations we can to pave the future, so why don't we just discuss a little bit about what those terms mean to us, because I think they're thrown around a lot, and these are words that actually have a lot of weight uh, both in our lives and the approach that we may have. You know, one thing that we learned during the pandemic right away is that we are only as healthy as our neighbors. We may think that we are siloed and protected by different economic levels or, to your point, people who are living on the front lines of a climate risk um, area. This affects us. Uh, in the pandemic, people who were suffering from food insecurity, how were they able to fight something when they didn't have proper nutrition? So we think about our neighbor as being essential to the growth of all of us. That to me is what equitable growth looks like and sustainable growth is something that is actually building for the future and regenerative. We're looking at what works for our health, for our economy, for our progress that is feeding a system that continues to progress and keep us all well. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on these words and how they frame um, the way you show up in your businesses and your life. Thank you. Uh, yes, first of all, I want to appreciate that we are talking about the value of sustainability and the value of an inclusive economy. We should start by like, yes, amen to that, and let's keep that as a value of ours, because if we value it and we keep talking about how we get there, it will start happening. You know, if we value food security, if we did truly value food security, we could have food security in this world. We sort of do know how to get there, right? If we value inclusion, we know the things to do to get there. Um, I'm going to give you two examples from the work that, that we're involved with. Uh, one is another uh, appreciation I'm going to shout out, which is an appreciation for the governments of Malawi, the government of Rwanda, um, and many of the other governments on the continent of Africa that are very forward thinking on both of these two issues. Uh, we had a delegation of senior government officials from Malawi, the chief economist and a number of ministry officials from Malawi come visit a program that we were working on with the government of Rwanda. And that program is getting uh, $8,000 seed grants to rural villages and running an inclusive village uh, planning process where women, men, young, and old decide how to use that $8,000 together, um, but also are planning beyond that, you know, what does our village development plan look like and how do we advocate for that. And the, the delegation from Malawi came to Rwanda, they came and sat in some village meetings um, and, you know, drove way outside of Kigali, uh, usually high-level government meetings stay in the capital cities, right? They drew, drove a few hours outside of Kigali, went and sat in a community meeting, and the ministry officials, they said, what is going on here? The, your community members are participating so much, like women are speaking up in this meeting, young people are speaking up in this meeting, you have ultra-poor who are also participating in, in deliberation here, and they seem to continue to be meeting well after the sort of first round of this. And that, to them, was the sustainability. Governments on the continent are sick of seeing prescriptive aid programs that come in, build water taps, and schools that fall apart a year later. And this is also what all the evaluation evidence shows. I was speaking to an economist recently who said they usually see development efforts fall apart after two years. Two years. That's what is not sustainable. <laughs> Let's look a decade out. Let's look 50 years out. Are communities still active? Are they still meeting? Are they still able to take charge and drive local change instead of being told to sit and wait for outsiders to do a bad job of it for them? That piece 
for sustainability was so important and felt great to hear the government officials actually uh, sort of nudging that along and, and reinforcing that. And the other side, on the inclusion side, and why I say it's also important for us to keep talking about this, we measure at the village level, um, our team has designed a number of metrics that are really important. So uh, it, at every village meeting that's hosted, okay. community members keep track of how many women are speaking at the village meeting, how many members of the village are actually attending this village meeting, um, how many young people are in village leadership, and how many are speaking in the meeting. So are they attending, are they speaking, and then are they running for local leadership? We try to, we show this data to all of our donor partners. Some of them really value it, and some of them ask, we don't care. We don't care about the, you know, who's at the village meeting or making the decisions. This seems really inefficient. So many village meetings, so many people involved. Like, what a waste of time. Why don't you just deliver the school building for them? It'll be more efficient. And it's not, right? Because the school building would fall apart for two years if you did it that way. But we have to value the piece around inclusion, measure it and track it and promote it so that it starts being valued by all of the actors who are involved in this. And for us, we're trying to do advocacy on the funder side to make sure that that's recognized and appreciated there as well and not sidelined. She's bringing up a really important point that I want like building a well to make us feel good. This is about listening both to the community and your story of the government coming in and actually sitting there and listening is huge because that's how we actually build new inroads. Would you share? Yeah, so I'm thinking about if we just look at inequity, right, um, and silo that and think about the last two, three years um, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, we could start at the dissemination of the vaccine, right? So we saw how that was done in the US. Um, you saw inequity across uh, the US in certain communities. Um, you know, you would read headlines and stories where individuals for more high income areas was they were accessing vaccines in low income areas, right? Uh, and so when we think about the accessibility of something as important as vaccines and what that looks like in the US, we could start there just by something that we all, everyone in this room experience. When you think about that globally, we're always, we're here sitting in the US and we're thinking like, okay, we're trying to access um, vaccines in our communities. We're trying to ensure that individuals have the opportunity, right, to be able to get a vaccine and for their families. Uh, but when you think globally and the rollout vaccines on a global le le layer and how that rollout happened, although we felt inequities here, we saw that on a much larger scale, uh, scale uh, across the world. Um, and when you think about how we begin to create sustainability um, when there are um, complete threats, uh, not only at our health, but our livelihood, we begin to think, how can we do things better next time, right? How do we make our efforts more sustainable? And we think about sustainability and how we begin to scale that, which is where, as an entrepreneur, as someone who owns a business, thinks about how can we innovate? Um, how can we not only come up with solutions, but then scale those solutions faster? Right, but then how do we partner with organizations, whether that be nonprofits, um, whether that be government institutions, to then enact things on the ground? The power of grassroots organizations and nonprofits is that they can reach areas that others can't reach. Uh, when we think about the South, when we think about um, global rural areas, right? How can we ensure that they are resourced, that they have the information, the tools, the money? right, to deploy on the ground. And that's why it's so important when we think about sustainability, when we think about uh, creating more equitable paths, that everyone must be at the table and everyone must have a responsibility and a job, right? Um, and that we're all aligned on what that looks like and how we deploy that together. And so when I think about how we're creating uh, more sustainable and equitable solutions at Resilia, it's interesting because we're in this tech for good space um, where we're solving a problem that has generally been solved by, or tried to be solved by consultants. Now, what's the issue of solving every problem with the army of consultants? <laughs> I see you guys' faces, you kind of know where I'm going here, right? And so, one, the biggest problem is they're hard to scale, right? 
and they're hard to deploy fast because you, you, people are hulling over here and this person has information that that person doesn't have and we have to call a group meeting, then we have to meet at the table, right? And so how can you bring everyone, technology, innovators, uh, entrepreneurs, government, nonprofits, uh, all to the table and you bring uh, a solution, you have a commonality, right? The problem itself that we're all being impacted by and to deliver that uh, with speed, agility, but also intentionality when we think about communities and how they need to be served um, and who speaks to those communities and who knows those communities the best because they have lived experience. And that's how I and our company are solving for that. So we're bringing large funders to the table, those who have the pocketbooks, right? So the Goldman Sachs, the Kellogg Foundations, the Ford Foundations, uh, the UNICEFs, the Oxfam Americas. And we're also bringing all these grassroots organizations to the table. We're also working with government. So whether that be the state government, where we think about the state of California, uh, the state of Arkansas, uh, the state of Texas, we need everyone at the table. There's a huge commitment that we have to ensure that uh, those who have the least aren't treated that way when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to information, and when it comes for them actually knowing the best needs and how to provide for their communities. And so when you think about sustainability and um, equitable outcomes in your work, right, in universities, uh, you have to also contribute, right? You have a ability to contribute. You have ability to contribute from your homes. And so definitely this idea of collective impact and how we solve the most urgent and pressing matters in the world and on a global scale requires all of us at the table. Okay, so I already knew that these two women were incredibly inspiring, but now you're starting to hear it as well. Um, I'm so excited to be starting off Women's History Month with these two powerful visionary leaders um, that both have already made notes about being open to partnerships and what that can look like when you have different stakeholders at the table. Um, I wanna back up. I'm just listening to you guys. I, I'm wondering if maybe the audience um, and some of these university students are, are thinking, oh my gosh, how did you guys get to this place? Um, it's so impressive. but. If you could go back with me for a minute and think about the why. You know, at, at my firm, Blank Space, we work with um, big companies, corporations, foundations, leaders, on creating authentic impact and scaling that um, and really looking at what that means for the long term. So a lot of the work we start with is the why. We don't want to see any more companies showing up to um, as we're calling now woke washing, right? Where they're plugging in because they feel like they need to say something, but it's really not authentic to who they are. Um, and that's, that's not what we're here to do, and that's not what CGI is about. And that's why I love being in these rooms because there's so many companies and there's so many leaders and there's so many entrepreneurs that are thinking about how do we do this right? Um, and so in the process, we start with the why. And whenever we're, I'm sitting down at a table with these companies, I say, why was your company founded? What was it that drove you to create this product? What was the opportunity in the marketplace that you were trying to solve? Who is your customer? What do your employees care about? And you start to dive into the idea that these big brands and um, powerful leaders are, are connected. You know, much like a city, these are organizations and ecosystems um, that make a difference and that show up in our lives. I don't think that a company today can be out of this conversation. It's not possible. So I say to you guys, going back, both of you, think about your why and, and how this path sort of opened for you. What drew you in um, and helped you to really step up into your own power as leaders to create both of your organizations? So I'll start with, and I love how you kind of frame this, um, uh, like the importance of why. Uh, and I'll start by saying, you know, you are your own competitive advantage, right? And the ability to show up in your work as yourself, to be able to show up with any of these ideas of these possible solutions um, with your own lived experience, right, as the foundation is really important. And when you aren't able to do that, right, you become your competitive disadvantage, 
right? You turn that into a competitive disadvantage against your work, against uh, the individuals that you want to serve and the populations and people, communities that you want to serve. Um, for me personally, when I think about my why and how um, Resilia started, it actually comes from my childhood. So I grew up in rural Louisiana, right, on a modern day, I say compound, because my grandmother's home sit in the center, and then my grandmother uh, had nine children, her and my grandfather, and um, because my grandfather was um, a Native American, he had land for each of his children. So if you come to my home in rural Louisiana, uh, where I grew up at, you'll see nine little small homes, right, around my grandmother and grandfather's home that still sits there. Uh, and I think about our stories and how we tell our stories. Uh, they're told through our memories. And I have really special memories of my childhood and growing up and feeling like I had enough and wanting to deliver that to others. Um, I also know that others have not had those same memories that I had. Uh, I think about reading uh, Viola Davis's memoir recently, <clears throat> and she grew up in Des Moines, and she says, you know, we were poor, and some people say that they were, they didn't have a lot, but they always had enough. She said, we were poor, we didn't have a lot, and I knew it, right? And so I think about my story and how that runs parallel to those who grew up in object poverty, you know, across the globe. How does my uh, ability to impact their lives today, how does my ability to want to solve the most critical problems uh, that face the world today um, matter and become a part of my why and my journey? And so I actually went off to college, a uh, first generation college student, and uh, I received several scholarships. So UNCF, Ron McDonald House scholarships. Um, but one of the most important scholarships that I received was the Bill and Melinda Gates Scholarship. And it was my entree into philanthropy, right? It was my introduction. And uh, they flew out like a thousand scholars from across the country who had won that year. And we met in Virginia. And over the course of three days, you know, we, we met many people from the foundation, uh, and Dr. Gates was actually our mentor that year. And so he came in and he really pressed upon us that you have an opportunity as college students, we're freshmen, right? We're just like very green at this point. You have an opportunity to build these amazing careers, but what will you do beyond that? Right? How will you build this purpose-driven life that goes beyond just making money? And so when I went back to my college campus, I was kind of empowered by hearing that and knowing like, oh wow, look at these individuals who have impacted my life. How do I give this back to the world? And so I matriculated through college um, kind of with this very social good, um, idealistic, imaginatory type of belief that I could do anything and change the world. And I still believe that, right? So I carried that through and through. And so I launched my first company when I was only 23. I had worked at a nonprofit called CASA, Court Appointing Special Advocates. And I had launched this campaign called the Forgotten Children's Campaign, which essentially helped foster children um, match to a volunteer that could be their support system, right, as they go in and out of uh, the judicial process. Um, and through that, people started recognizing my work. And they were like, oh, we would love for you to come on board to help us with our philanthropic efforts at such and such foundation or this philanthropist, philanthropist that was um, based in Chicago. And so I started doing that consultancy work um, with those organizations, the nonprofits and uh, philanthropic organizations as a whole. And as I was doing that work, I was going in, um, I was getting funded with these large technical assistance grants to provide this service. And I started to think, huh, we would go in, we would do all these things, but once we left, generally the work did not continue without us. And so from there, I started to look at how technology could solve for the problems that I was seeing, remove the silos that were existing through organizations, create a continuum of service that we were not seeing, drastically reduce the cost so that more organizations could assess it even without their funders, and then deliver it through a software solution. And so that's what gave rise to what is now Resilia. But it started back from the foundation of growing up in rural Louisiana, right? It continued when I was connected with the Gates Foundation, 
many of how you all are being connected here through the Clinton Foundation, right? I was inspired to continue that work after college, and it has now grown to Resilient Now, which we're venture-backed, um, almost $50 million raised, uh, which is not easy to do. Uh, and we exist not only in the U.S., but outside of the U.S. as well. I just want to touch on something else that you brought up, because I think that there's an overgeneralization sometimes that um, people with a lack of resources feel or, or behave or experience life in a certain way. And I'm so just grateful for your share. Thank you. Because just I was sitting there just thinking about being in one of those, those houses next to your family and growing up and the way you expressed it as being so rich and, and so loving. I'm really appreciative of that. And I think that's an important note to make. And it actually segues perfect to, Sasha, what you were saying earlier about we actually need to hear from the communities because they have a much better understanding of their environment, what's happening, what they need. Um, and I don't know, just thank you so much for sharing. That was really personal and I loved it. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. It's beautiful to learn about. I uh, grew up in um, lower Manhattan, uh, five blocks north from ground zero. And when it was still an artist neighborhood, <laughs> it is no longer, but it was then. My dad's an abstract painter and my mom had been a sculptor. And when 9-11 happened, it was, I was in middle school and it was this moment of asking, when I had to ask myself, what is America's role in this world and how are we showing up? How are we showing up in other parts of the world? I grew up in New York, you know, in, in the public school system in New York and we, to be, quite honest, at that point, did not learn about many of the continents that exist in our world. And it led me to have a lot of questions to learn about the areas that we weren't learning about in school. And that sort of set me on this track of, of wanting to learn what we weren't being taught and also wondering how we possibly are still living in a world where billions of people can't meet basic needs and live with dignity. That just, it's, we have enough of capital, smarts, and care that that should no longer be the case. Uh, and so in my sort of journey through uh, high school and university, in university I um, ended up designing a major to ask that very question. How do we build a world where everybody can meet their most basic fundamental needs and live with dignity? How do we get there? Uh, and it wasn't yet a major at the school, so I designed my own major, putting together economics courses and anthropology courses, and political science ones and felt like, you know, the poli-sci folks thought the whole world was made up of uh, nation states and the economics folks thought the world was made up of businesses and the anthropology folks thought the world was made up of cultures. And it's like, oh, these all exist together. So uh, how, how are they all working together to get to that world that we want to see? And um, I went to school up in Vermont and followed a few friends who were from South Sudan uh, to South Sudan which was emerging from over two decades of civil war and an amazing moment when the region was about to gain independence. And this moment for independence is like this hope that you have control finally over your own future, right? What a beautiful moment. And yet when they showed me around uh, the region that we were in in South Sudan, it, they were really showing me around to failed development projects and we would ask, you know, my friends would ask, you know, moms on, in the village or guys who are sitting by the side of the river, like, you know, about the future. And they would say, oh, we're sitting and we're waiting. We're sitting and we're waiting for the US or the UN to come in and fix these things. And it felt like the aid industry had, uh, was sort of acting in a way that was opposed to, to the actual goals, right? We were imposing aid efforts that were teaching people that they don't actually have the agency over their own lives. And what does a really wonderful country look like? A wonderful country looks like one where everybody knows their own power and worth and it has the capital and the decision-making authority to create the future that they want to see. Um, and so that set me on a journey of, of asking how can we transform the aid industry and the philanthropic industry so that the money that is being, is supposed to be used 
uh, towards a better, more prosperous future for all, it's actually getting directly into the hands of communities uh, and letting folks make those decisions themselves. Let's get out of the way. Like, if there's somebody like me who looks like me from the US and we're, I'm trying to make a decision for a village in East Africa, that makes no sense at all. I should not be part of that decision-making process. <laughs> you should be very skeptical of that. <laughs> uh, and we can also change those financial flows. So I moved to Rwanda back in 2010 when I graduated. And, uh, and we ended up accidentally starting this organization called Spark and testing out, we had about $10,000 to try out this idea of give, you know, getting money directly into the hands of uh, families in rural villages and seemed to, to sort of work and communities were doing great projects. And so we kept going, um, kept raising more and more funds. We're 13 years later, so it's been a journey. And 13 years later, I would say, though, we are getting to do way bigger, better stuff. Like, we thought back then, oh, how incredible if one day every village got a seed grant. And they didn't have to apply for it, right? What, like, why is the village applying for a grant? Every village has a great idea. Every village should have money. <laughs> Let's get a grant to every single village and let them make the decisions over it. And today we are working in service of the government of Rwanda, in service of the governments of Malawi and Ghana and Uganda and many other countries to make it a universal approach. Now we're an $8 million, $8.5 million organization. We have over 70 uh, incredible team members. You're hearing from me today, but really all the brilliance is in East Africa. My colleague Alan Makabai is the one who developed a lot of the facilitation methodology that's being used. Uh, in Rwanda, our colleagues borrowed from uh, pre-colonial organizing practices of Ubudehe and Mihigo in Uganda that have also uh, become part of this program. Um, and uh, and it's, an, it's like a whole new era for the organization now, one that sometimes I wonder like, oh wow, like it was, it was worth the 13 years of trying and testing and being frustrated that we were so small to get to the place where now we actually do have the opportunity to work on some of the larger systemic level questions and, and really with government, which there's a, you know, as a millennial, we're like very skeptical of institutions and I think you know, the next generations are even more skeptical of institutions. Uh, and we also have to ask ourselves, like, how are we going to change those institutions that still govern to work for us and not let them off the hook for that? So it's been very fun. I've been very grateful for it. Oh my gosh, say the why. It's my favorite question. Um, so I want to dive into some of what you both brought up. Uh, so Varsha, I'd like to start with you. and. The fact that you've raised $50 million is huge. Um, I'm sure you faced some tough moments in that journey. Forbes article actually quoted it um, saying that you defied funding as a black woman. And when they use the word defy, it's because it's, to say it's hard, uh, to say it's smaller. I'm actually working on some research right now with Vanderbilt University, very excited to um, give them a shout out on uh, black innovation in healthcare and funding and looking at um, where the drop off is. And 90% of capital raised by black founders um, doesn't go past series A. And when we think about that um, and the past few years as I was speaking earlier on um, companies and capital wanting to be a part of moving founders of color forward and making that a priority um, that is being spoken about, but how much action and money is going and, and, why, and the why there. Um, would you talk about your experience a little bit in that and how it feels to be you know, featured in an article of that uh, uh, with, and there was a couple other female um, founders featured as well around how you guys had just defied the odds. <laughs> Um, so I'll start by saying that it's extremely hard to raise capital, period, and that only a very small percentage of all companies are raising or do successfully raise venture capital. Um, and so generally what we're seeing as far as how that's broken up, we're seeing a very small number and then it's broken across, right? How much do women raise? Less than 2%, right? How much do women of color raise? How much do black women raise? Um, Latinx women raise? Uh, and so from that um, framing, I think it's important to understand like what are the, the actual dynamics at place. Um, it's interesting because I just had a conversation recently um, with someone 
regarding the Forbes article, and it was like, I loved it, but I hated it too, right? Um, and it was like, you just announced this huge raise, and you know, it's almost like, oh wow, like we have to focus on this because we just don't see it so often because it becomes the story because it's like a, a black woman, the largest raise of a um, solo female founder, all these firsts that we tend to uh, enlarge those things that happen because it's so rare, right? And so the individual was like, I would love for them to have announced your raise so much they announced all the raises, right? It's a focus on your product and your company and how much you actually raise. But because it's so rare, the story becomes engulfed into um, that. And so for me, you know, my journey has definitely been uh, a roller coaster. Uh, we've raised, this is our fourth financing round. Um, we started with a small pre-seed round where we consider our friends and families. Some people say friends, families, and fools, right? Because they're taking <laughs> the biggest bet on you. They really believe in you. Um, and we raised like $400,000. And I was like, okay, maybe we can get this MVP, Mineral Viable product, um, into market, right? And maybe people will start utilizing it and we can grow from there. Um, and then I raised my seed round and I think back to my seed round and I um, was just talking to someone who had the opportunity to attend NOE because I'm from New Orleans. Um, and I was one of the participants that pitched at NOE and I ended up losing, right? Great pitch though, I must say. <laughs> but I lost and it was a good lesson in failure. Um, but at the time, TPG Capital, which is one of the largest private equity uh, funds in the world, um, were funding that um, pitch competition. And so in doing so, each person that was a part of the competition had these mentors or advisors for uh, alongside them for like two to three weeks, kind of prepping them for their pitch. Um, and one of them was a guy named Tim Milliken, um, which was this white guy out of like Kansas, but he lived in San Francisco. And he, um, after the pitch competition, I emailed him. I was like, you know, sorry guys, we didn't win this one, but next time, thank you for your support. And he responded back to me and he said, I thought you had a really good business and concept. If you're ever in San Francisco, look me up. And so I'm on this journey trying to raise capital, raise my seed round, and I'm exhausted. I'm like, okay, you know, the gas is running out. Um, will we be able to do it? We, will we successfully be able to raise the money to keep going? Um, and I just happened to be in the Bay Area because I went there for a conference, a tech conference, um, to continue raising. And I decided to reach out to him. I was like, oh, he's probably not gonna even respond. Now, if you know uh, PE firms, if you knew who Tim Milliken was, he's, one of, uh, he's a buyout investor. Right, so he buys companies for billions of dollars, and you know, so he doesn't have a lot of time to talk to founders who are raising two million dollars. But I reached out, and he responded, and he said, "Yeah, let's meet up. Let's get lunch together." And we sat down in San Francisco, um, and I told him, you know, how my fundraising journey was going, and he was like, "I'll write you a check. I think you're doing great work. I'm going to write you a check." And so he did, and because of the power of his name on my cap table. I was able to raise the rest of my round like that. And so the, the point of the story is all you really need is like one yes, right? Um, and then I would go on to raise um, a series A, eight million, and then our series B, 35 million and so on. Um, and so for me, uh, ensuring that I had not only the resilience, so we talk about that, resilience and even my company, to keep going when I thought that we were going to run out of gas and getting kind of this lifeline from someone who said yes, um, and that being the fuel that I needed to keep um, the company growing and um, ensuring that we could continue to stay, scale and grow the company into our next round uh, was very intentional and powerful. And he didn't care that, you know, I was a, a black woman. Even more so, he was like, you, are, you aren't getting enough funding. Yep. Like, what's, what's the problem? How can I help here? Yep. Right? He was like, you need to be able to raise your next round. You need to write investors on your cap table to raise your next round. Um, and so the investors that I ended up meeting along the way were so diverse, right? And each of them understood not only the intentionality that they needed to put into a company um, run by a black woman, meaning that they knew I was gonna face 
um, new hurdles with fundraising, right? Uh, but they also knew that I was building a great company and that my traction and what we were building was gonna be able to pull me through. Now, because we're in this tech for good landscape, I always tell people 10 years ago, we couldn't have built Resilia because the philanthropy, philanthropy tech and VC didn't necessarily come together the way you're seeing it happen now. Um, and VCs weren't necessarily investing in tech for good at all. Uh, but the world has changed, right? And we are seeing that change happen every single day. And uh, when I raised my Series B, we had reached attraction uh, that was so significant and we were proving uh, all of these key things, our, our market, right? We were um, proving our value proposition to our customers and our users. We had over 140% net revenue retention, right? So we were ensuring that our customers not only came to us, but they also stayed with us over a long duration of time. And so at the end of the day, it was beyond just what we, I looked like or anyone else, it was based on the traction, the company that we had built. And um, for me, it's important that we continue to provide uh, arenas where we can successfully talk to each other, kind of talk through our problems um, as women, as women of color, um, so that we can get over the hurdles and also get in front of the right investors, because oftentimes we spend so much time trying to get money from the wrong investors. Um, and so, I will say, you know, that article, uh, many other articles, I was in um, Inc. 100 Women, yeah. Changing Countries, and the writer was like, way down in Louisiana, there, can you believe there's this founder in New Orleans building this big company, right? Um, and so you have to continuously, one, build, be okay with building where you're at, right? Because some people can be discouraged. You can be like, oh, there's no one around me doing this. How am I gonna be successful? Uh, you have to not only aggregate, but bring resources to you, but also understand how do you go out and get those resources, even if you have to bring them back in. Um, and I wanted to do that and wanted to continue to build where I was from. Do you guys, I mean, this front row is taking notes. I'm watching, I'm taking notes. Everyone at home I know is taking notes. There were so many lessons packed into that. It is amazing. Show up as who you are, right? And, and don't allow the world to, to put you into any category. The idea of failure, you know, Seth Godin actually, one of um, his uh, things on what makes a successful founder, uh, it's, there's this arc, and I'm a founder, and you're a founder, we've all started organizations here. You get to a point for everyone that, and you can hear it that, you know, the, the biggest and most successful uh, entrepreneurs talk about this too, where it just feels like there's nowhere else to go. You are exhausted, you have tried everything, your dream that you believed in, and, and you're like, why isn't the world seeing it? And that is the push point that actually makes for success, is pushing past that. That's where a lot of people give up. And you explain that in a way that was just remarkable. Also, um, I think that you made some other really, really important points around uh, diversity in a different way. Like, diversity is not just the color of your skin or your gender. When she talked about her diverse cap table and the idea that people from different backgrounds came together, um, helped drive her business, helped her think about asking for more money, helped her think about what scale really looks like. Um, I think we could all think about that, like how we're building, you know, in the business world, we'd say a diverse portfolio, don't put all your money in one place. I think that's how we should all be building our initiatives, our organizations, our companies. Um, I have a board of directors of my life, and these are the advisors that I can tap um, when I need to check in on, you know, what, whether it's something in the company or it's something that's happening in my own life. Um, I really encourage everyone to think about that and, and who might be on their own personal Board of Directors, thank you. That was really, um, really, every time uh, you just take it so personal and I really appreciate that. And Sasha, I would love to hear about your thoughts on, on, on that around partnership and collaboration. You're raising capital as well in a totally different way. Um, what is that like? And I'm sure you have doors that seem closed and then you see the other door that's open. Would you speak a little bit about that? I would love to. And I also want to go back to one of the things that you mentioned, which is so important, I feel like, and uh, I have learned at least so much from. And I'm curious if you both have thoughts on this. The, the number or the percentage of VC capital 
that you mentioned that goes to women founders and then black and brown and uh, uh, folks of color and uh, you know all the there's it's low it's under two percent it was under two percent a decade ago yeah. a decade ago people were talking about this it was under two percent and then the recent report came out what was it this year or last year? So yeah, this year it went down. It right? went down. It went up it in went 2020. Up. <laughs> yeah, so it went up in uh, 2021. Um, a lot of that had to do with the attention on George Floyd and people checking their selves. Um, and now in 2022, we're seeing, especially now in 2023, even though we're only uh, in March, a change in that financing. Um, and yeah, so yeah. that's happened. And there was a lot of layoffs uh, recently in the tech industry. A lot of those were diversity programs. We could get into that, but I'm oh, more interested to hear about what Sasha has to say. The, what I'm curious about is if you guys have things that um, you talk to folks about to help coach them and how to ask you the right questions. Like one of the studies that I saw around the uh, limit of VC capital to women founders is that women founders uh, are asked more about risk, and male founders are asked more about their big dream and their ambition. And women and men both do that. So we, you know, we're, we're sort of, all parties are asking women more about risk and men more about reward. Now, if you're asking somebody, a founder, about the big vision, you're inherently thinking bigger, right? You're, you're getting excited about the company's potential value and future and service to society. And if you're asking about risk, you are thinking smaller. And I think we've seen a lot of companies that haven't addressed risk have a lot of challenges because of that. And a, a lot of underinvested companies um, that weren't allowed to dream as big maybe as they should have been because of these questions. So I'm curious if there are, like that's something that um, I always appreciate it when folks, you know, funders ask us what our big vision is. Uh, we love talking about that. And I'm curious if there's, there are questions that we should also encourage folks to be asking founders. A hundred percent, yeah. I, I mean, I think you're really diving into what we think about capital and our role in that. I, I think that to your point, right? Like to your point uh, and back to your story and the point that you're making, it, you don't know what you don't know. And you being able to reach out to um, this person that she connected with, that she kept in touch with, um, again, you know, this goes back to thinking about the rooms that we're in, um, but, but not just asking everybody all the time for help, reaching out at the right moment to the right person and being open to whatever that may lead to. Um, to your point of what are the right questions, it's hard. I think the one thing that you demonstrated well is sometimes you're a trailblazer and you're creating something that doesn't exist. That's what we call the blank space in, in my firm around how, how is impact and capital working together? Um, and that's a tricky place. And when you said that tech and philanthropy have not been in the, these rooms having this conversation before um, with, with capital, that needed you to actually put them in the room. And I think we underestimate that. So to your point, being the first and driving and thinking big is going is going to require someone seeing your vision. So I really appreciate that. And I think that founders can push back, right? You can actually say, I appreciate your question. I appreciate why you're asking this. But also, can we just actually go really big right now and then work backwards? Because by, by building in these little speed bumps, you're not actually allowing me to take you on this journey that we see. So that's a great question for this room and we're really close to questions. So I hope all of you scribbling are ready to go. Um, okay, but keep, keep Sasha, finish but the other piece about- Yeah, no, I would experience. say that yeah. like reframing the conversation is important. Sometimes you have to do that in real time. Um, and I think it's important for us to have this conversation in this room because some of you might go off to be VCs and to, be, to come into the room and create a more equitable standing for everyone that walks in in front of you is really important. Cool, thank you for, uh, I, I wa always am wanting to be a better advocate, you know? <laughs> we just wanna hang out with each other up here all day and ask each other questions because this is amazing. On the collaboration front, uh, I, 
ironically, in university, I never took a public, everybody's like, oh, take a public speaking class. That's like gonna be a really valuable thing, you know, for the rest of your life. I was like, no way, I'm never gonna be in a position that I should <laughs> need that skill for. Here you are. <laughs> Similarly with fundraising, I was like, I never thought I would be fundraising in this world. Like, where did, when did that happen? Um, and have had really wonderful funding partners that have uh, partnered with us and allowed us to do what we were just talking about, a dream, What what was our vision for the organization and for changing the way that philanthropy and aid works so that it can better serve people? Uh, and, and we just um, shifted recently, you know, we were $10,000 budget in 2010. Uh, this year we're in 8.6. And in a, a year and a half ago, we pivoted to this new strategy for the organization that's really around coalitions. Uh, none of us can do, change these big systems uh, alone. And so we are working in coalition with governments and civil society groups. And we said, we need a longer you know, tail for this. So uh, let's build a three-year strategy uh, to show how we'll work with governments, serve governments, so that they can take this model to scale. Every village across you know, the country of Rwanda, every village across Malawi gets this opportunity. Um, we, we need to work with private philanthropic capital, but we also want to work with the World Bank, who's actually the largest funder of governments to do social service programs, so we can't forget about them. And there's actually some really fantastic people at the bank who also want to change how the capital is flowing. It's been one of the more rewarding conversations we've been a part of recently. There's a fund that's an $8 billion fund uh, that is supposed to be deployed to decentralized approaches. There's a tiny little pot of money at the World Bank, um, but that's a good amount of capital to be deploying uh, and decentralizing to villages. Um, and so recently we shifted uh, from raising, just like fundraising every single year, to raising a philanthropic round. And I think it's something the for-profit sector does really well. You say, here's what we want to achieve in the next you know, two, three years. This is how much capital we need for it. So we did the same thing. And we actually launched this at CGI uh, back in September. We launched a $25 million philanthropic round, um, said this is our three-year strategy. We want to you know, have a step function increase in scale, move from 100 villages a year reach to uh, you know, reaching a thousand villages over the course of the next three years and set up these national scale programs in partnership with the government and the World Bank. And um, since September of last year, we raised 20 of the $25 million. Um, thanks. Yeah. That's really thanks to the philanthropic organizations also starting to imagine beyond just how philanthropy has been done in the past. And like, that's the, that is the fun part of this. We all get to imagine new ways to build institutions. And yeah, like let's dive into that. It doesn't need to be the same way it's been done in the past. Let's build the ways we want these organizations to function in the future. And I'm really grateful we work with foundations that that actually believe in that. Siegel Family Foundation, CRI Foundation, uh, many foundations that are paving the way of a new way of working. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up to questions, um, although I already have 10 more, so if you guys don't have any, but I think you do. Um, we have microphones in the room, so just raise your hand and we'll come over to you. Okay, we have to come to the, my front row, a student's over here. Is it on? Can you hear me? Introduce yourself, please, okay. and your university, and then your question. Okay, my name is uh, Kyle Toller. I am a political science student at the University of Lynchburg in Lynchburg, Virginia. And so I have a question um, for uh, Sasha in particular. So I actually run a not-for-profit that helps with medical donating medical supplies, particularly diabetes supplies, to um, diabetes clinics in South Sudan. And so um, I've traveled there. I've traveled there twice, and um, I help with two you. clinics. Yeah, excuse me. Go you. <laughs> Thank work. you. So that's. I was like really enthusiastic when you said South Sudan. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what a small world. And so my question for you is: in in your experience, you you specialize in like helping local economies and you know getting outside of like urban areas. And so I've mostly been helping with diabetes clinics in the capital of South Sudan, Juba. And I've been struggling to find a way to kind of expand that outside the capital to more of the rural areas where there could be more diabetics and more people in need that need those crucial supplies. And I've been trying to figure I've been trying to figure out how to do that. And I was I'm gonna ask you what would you be your, your advice on expanding to those rural areas and more tribal areas where there's less medical supplies. Well first of all 
thank you for doing that work. Thank you for doing it in South Sudan. And also thank you for focusing on diabetes, which is a really growing uh, issue area for a lot of the global south. Uh, the global north has already sort of peaked in its, uh, <laughs> in its uh, challenges there. Um, but this is a big issue, and it's great that you're focused on it. Thank you for doing that, and keep, keep that going. I'm also a type 1 diabetic, which is the you know, personal connection there. Good. Thank you for bringing your own passion to it. Mm -hmm. um, and personal experience that makes you an even better leader. I, I would say there are really some ways to do this, uh, to expand access in rural areas. And the number one way is what we were just talking about with partnerships. There are probably are a number, and we can speak afterwards around who these organizations might be, uh, organizations that are already trying to expand access to uh, healthcare in the rural areas. Um, some, you know, beautiful locally led organizations that are have been doing this work for a long time, uh, and some, you know, non nation state based uh, organizations as well. And tapping into the work that they're already doing, so you have a channel to distribute your program without having to recreate the distribution lines, uh, can save you a lot of time and headache and also get greater uptake of the program on the other end. Um, for example, like when we do our community organizing process at the village level, uh, when the COVID vaccine came into Rwanda, the government said, well, can you promote our distribution program for the vaccine through the local youth leaders that you've trained? Every village elects two young leaders under 35, we train them. And those facilitators essentially, um, you know, told community members about the vaccine, who was priority for getting the vaccine, and it really aided in the adoption of the distribution of the vaccination program. You get the highest uptake when you already have a local leader who's trusted. And so there are some shortcut ways to do that where there might be organizations that already have that built out that you can tap into and, and support the great work that they're doing through just, you know, your program sort of supporting the work they're already doing. Awesome, so, thank you. All right, next question. How about this woman right in the second row here? Hi, um, my name is Luanda. I'm from South Africa. I'm a medical doctor, currently Fulbrighting at the University of Washington. Um, I'm in the public health space, and I, in the seven months that I've been here and arrived, we, we've learned the very sinister, the sinister side of global aid. Um, how do you marry the tension between um, the donor's priority and um, the community's priorities and needs? Ooh, I grapple with this all the time. This is not an easy one. We all, as humans, we like to have ownership over the things that we're doing, right? You, you believe most in your own ideas. There's a behavioral study that shows in a conversation, you remember mostly what you said in the conversation, not what somebody else said in the conversation. And I think that that exemplifies this tension in the donor, uh, in the philanthropic world, and how to prioritize community voice and power as well. And um, that is a huge tension, right? Because the donor needs to also know that they're important in this equation, but, and the community needs to have the final decision-making authority. There is a, a way that um, we actually do see those things coming together. And the hope that I have there is that donors really want to be doing the smartest thing with their money. They want their money to go the furthest, right? They would rather have 10 years of impact instead of two years of impact. Who wants an unsustainable, you know, who wants to fund the thing that's gonna fall apart in two years? You want the thing that's gonna last for 10, 50, 100 years, that's the smartest thing to do with your money. And a lot of, people who are in the philanthropic space also have started their own businesses. And if you're a business owner or you're an investor in businesses, you know the power of ownership. And the power of ownership is that founders take care of their things the best. That's why you invest in founders, right? So we can do the same thing on the philanthropic side. Invest in communities being the founders of their own projects. It makes a lot of sense. So when, when we speak with a lot of philanthropic folks, they actually really love this idea. It just hasn't yet quite been presented to them as an option. They're trained to think that on, the, on their investment side, they should invest in great ideas and founders. And then on the philanthropic side, they're coached to say, pick a subject, pick education or health or livelihoods. 
and all of a sudden you, be, you get siloed in these buckets. That's not the most effective way to do philanthropy. The most effective way to do philanthropy is actually borrow from that other side. Think about how are you supporting communities to be the founders of their own work, and how are you supporting organizations that you're funding to also have big, bold, great ideas for changing some big system that exists today that isn't serving people as well as they could be. And I'll give a two, maybe two examples. Um, one is that in senior year of university, I was uh, uh, Googling in my library, like funders Africa, very naively, and probably blind emailed about 100 groups. And I blind emailed this group, which is now the Siegel Family Foundation. And I, this guy, uh, Barry Siegel, got back to me, and he goes, I don't really get what you're doing, but here's $1,000, good luck. You know? <laughs> and I thought, what a beautiful, like, blind sort of faith and, like, optimism of just, like, let this student go try something out. We sort of try to extend that at the community level, too, right? Like, let's just give every village a shot and 100% do great things with it uh, on that side. The other thing is that on the world, the, the largest funder is the World Bank. Um, this really is... the but this is the largest like aggregated funder, right, for social public goods. And they also want this to happen. You know, when I speak to folks at the World Bank, they're saying, how can we work together to set our own standards at the World Bank so that we can actually get money directly to the village level? And what are, can you advise us on the standards to make sure that women are included in that process? So we've actually been drafting standards with the World Bank and with our civil society partners that can possibly get adopted by the bank in their financing. I'll just say, I think people want it. And we've, we're organizing folks around the possibility to, that yes, this is actually possible. Let's make it a little bit easier for everybody to buy into that. And then I actually need to say one thing. I know I'm going on, but I love, this is such an important question. This actually is the lowest cost, highest impact model for philanthropy. <laughs> there was an external firm that evaluated our methodology last year, and it shows the model has a 28x return on investment. 28x. The like GiveWell's an organization that rates like the top level charities. Like their top charities, it's like 10 to 20x is like the all stars of the world, and cash is like 1x or 2x at best. So 28X is like, this is the smartest thing for philanthropists to be doing, and it is going to happen. Like, this era will come about. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, we have now probably 160 funders on our platform, and this is the best time that you can be in, right, over the course and history of philanthropy to get funders to back uh, more unrestricted gifts, right? Because over the past two years, um, philanthropy have come to the table and almost a, a reckoning of sorts is happening. Um, the pandemic uh, has spurred that where people are rethinking how they have historically done philanthropy and people are saying that we need to um, undo some of this big brother we are telling you what to do with the funding. We want to see these very specific things happen. Um, and then also being open to changing course when what we thought was gonna happen did not happen. And now we need to um, really make some additions um, or we need to reallocate funding in other places. Because what we found was that organizations didn't want to come to their funders and say, this isn't working. We thought it was gonna happen this way, but we really need to do this, this, and that, right? And go into this direction. And we might actually need additional capital to do that. And so it kind of goes back to something that I said related to um, on the investor side, very similar to donors, um, is that you have to find the right mm -hmm. donors, mm -hmm. right? Who are willing to back in um, really drive what you're capital, trying to do. Not just yeah, it is. Capital, it's capital. Either side. Because yeah. it can be on either side. Um, impact investing. Yep. Um, and you see it happening more now than ever. So you are at the best time that you could have been in history mm -hmm. to find that type of capital. I'd add just for, for everyone to think about, um, there's a level setting on this stage around jadedness. None of us are walking into conversations with a preconceived idea of how they're coming to the table. We just want to help bring ideas and opportunities, and that creates a different energy. It creates an energy where people will write checks um, because of progressive ideas. 
um, on either side of capital from, from whatever portfolio we're dis discussing. Um, I think that's a really important point that I've heard from both of our panelists. Um, and when I'm working sometimes with a lot of younger generation leaders and social entrepreneurs, I get that. Like, how can you work with these terrible, big, bad X, Y, Z? And that's not the case. And the people we work with are excited and thinking about new ideas. So I encourage you all in your meetings to really enter in that space. And um, an investor um, that I know very well, who's incredible, um, he always says, we actually invest in the founder, not the business. I've never seen a business plan that didn't look good, right? <laughs> no one's ever putting together a business plan that's like, this might fail. So it is about you. It is about knowing your story, knowing your why, showing up in that strength and the big idea. So I think that that is all very important points. Is there a question on this side of the room maybe? We haven't gone over here. Okay, back over here, maybe someone towards the second half of the room, mix it up, diversity of space. Oh, okay. <laughs> the far back on the left. Also. Yeah, the corner, in the, sh in the sh shadows. I would definitely want that question. Great. I'm like really bad with Mike, so hopefully this works. Um, my name's Tim Gerlando. I am a poli-sci mass communication student from Stony Brook University. And one thing that has kind of dominated this whole uh, panel and conversation has been on the idea of capital, you know? Uh, and I kind of want to ask this to everybody here. So. You know, we're trying to discuss how we can invest in capital in terms of providing to uh, un um, disenfranchised communities, uh, people who haven't always been able to gain capital or get a say in that. And even when we're talking about raising capital, it's not always from people who necessarily are able to give back or not everybody is able to provide capital uh, to these organizations. So I want to know just like, obviously in a practical sense, money is the biggest equator to capital that we have right now. Uh, in your minds, what do we think of capital as just like a monetary value? And if we can get everybody uplift communities, can we like start rethinking what we define as capital? So it's not just equating to dollar signs. Yes, preach, I love that. Um, so there are some organizations working on this and thinking about time, um, thinking about what resources mean. What, what you are actually hitting on is something I talk a lot about with public-private partnerships. Um, there is so much more to a partnership than the check that they write. Um, thinking about resources in a way of how they can infuse you to scale um, and what they've already learned um, and connecting communities, uh, I 100%. I, um, so I definitely think that you're a point. I'm so happy you asked this question because we actually should bring it back now to the reason everyone walked in the door and thinking about how this work is actually infecting people in the lowest income areas. And yes, capital, but I think another thread that we've heard on this stage is that you have to listen to those communities and what they need. You could write all the checks in the world and they don't go anywhere. They don't make, they don't make something that's lasting and move. Um, I'd love for you guys to jump in as well. Um, yeah, I'll keep it pretty short and simple. Um, and yes, you have human capital and social capital, right? Um, I couldn't have told you how many times that I was in a room and I heard someone speak, and by that one connection, um, it changed the, the course of my life, right? And so we do think about capital outside of just the monetary gift of money, and we look at how we can scale, mobilize people, and what does that mean to change outcomes, to change policy, um, to direct uh, communities um, in various directions. And it does require people giving of their time, their commitments, right, as we know here, um, and then doubling down on executing against those commitments. And so that is very truly uh, a core portion of it that goes beyond just the monetary gift. Yeah. I feel like you probably have a lot more to share with us on this point. <laughs> <laughs> so I would invite you to share a little more. And it's important for us to recognize that capital isn't the only thing that holds value, monetary capital. It's a very important piece, yes. And people who don't have access to capital should have access to capital, monetary capital. In all the research, sometimes we geek out on the research on, there's, you know, the development sector loves to over-research things that sometimes are very obvious, but we still research it. <laughs> and one of the things that the research has shown over and over again is that social networks 
are just as important for economic development. Um, and something that seems undervalued in conversation, even about capital development, like you know, monetary capital development, is community capital. Do you have a sense of community? And that in that, you know, generates well-being in many different forms. It generates social connectivity um, that benefits society in many ways. That uh, I think currently in the West we we want it. We want a sense of community, but we don't quite know how to talk about it, and we're not valuing it as much as we could be. Um, and then we try to build community through, you know, ways that make money, but it doesn't. That's not the way to build community. Like you see every big company saying community on it, and you're like, that's not the feeling you get from that company, though, right? <laughs> you're getting something else from that company, but it's not a sense of community. <laughs> you're getting a sense of community when you go to a town hall meeting, when you're going to your student lounge and talking about ideas for the world, when you're showing up for your participatory budgeting process, when you're doing something with your neighbors that benefits your local community, and that's a really important thing for society. If, and when we don't have that, we get like backdoor communities like incel starting on Facebook chat groups, you know, it's like some really bad stuff on the other side of that, so. Yeah, thank you for bringing that question back. Um, we could actually keep going on this topic, as you can see, it's been a very vibrant panel. Um, I definitely will be continuing and posing some of these questions on online, on Instagram, please, we'd like you to weigh in and continue to ask, we wanna hear what's going on, so find me on there. I'll be sure to reach back out. Um, Savitra has an incredible book of lessons learned. Resilient, would you like to just for a second give a plug to your book, because I think we all need it. Yeah, um, if you send me a LinkedIn message, I'll send you one in the mail. But it basically talks about my journey in building and scaling companies from bootstrapping my first company to then raising venture in my second company and all the ins and outs of doing so. Yeah, I mean, we really are here on this stage because we care. We care about where you guys are going. We care about this work and sharing lessons learned. So thank you guys for showing up and being here, an amazing, amazing audience. Um, and we actually, I do think we have a survey that's coming up. We, you know, I mean,